and I'm back with Steve McCoy. This is part two, talking about making disciples, more on the one-on-one -on -one, uh, approach to making disciples. And in the second talk, we're going to be talking about uh, making disciples using everyday people. Uh, and that's something that is incredibly important uh, to, to me personally. And so I'm really looking forward to talking with Steve about that. Hey man, good this to, to jump into part two here. It's, and it's such a critical conversation. So thanks again for, for opening the door. Absolutely. And if you're catching part two, but didn't catch part one, make sure you go back and watch that because it really dovetailed so well into the second part. So how have you seen every God use everyday people? Obviously it's all over the Bible. And when God does it that way, you're like, that was clearly God, you know, Literally. I mean, yeah. so talk to us about that. Yeah. So, you know, inadvertently, if we kind of, we back up a little bit and I'm always, I think, you know, in the position of being a lead pastor, one of the things that just comes with the turf is solving problems. And it just seems to be endless of <laughs> facing, you know, uh, decisions and whatnot, and as many people do. And so one of the things that we have inadvertently created in our church culture is that expert culture and everybody has in their church, you know, men, women that know the Bible so well and unintentionally everyday people often feel like I can't do that. Boy, I, I don't, I can't, you know, not only find, you know, Obadiah in the Bible, I'm not sure how to spell it. <laughs> and, uh, and so again, I'll just repeat my observation in more than four decades in ministry is that people don't get in, involved in disciple making at a very intentional level because they just don't feel like they can. They don't feel inadequate. And so we preach at times as pastors, we preach, uh, you know, a higher level concept, you know, and hey, go into the world, make disciples and everybody, you know, listening to those messages or nodding their head up and down. Okay, totally get it, get the, the great commission, et cetera. And then if you saw them eye to eye in the hallway and said, okay, you know, Bob, go for it. You know, they, you'd see, you know, the old deer in headlights. What do I do? Do I go to the coffee shop? Do I break out the book of John? What would I ask? And so Again, this is, you know, sounds like I'm a salesperson for uh, discipleship.org, but it's what I love about it. You know, the tribe of leaders in discipleship.org, this is what we're doing. We're trying to, to help people get there, not just by telling them the what, but by telling them the how. So often in this expert culture, discipleship is the answer to break that so that we can get everyday people involved in the game. Mm. I would say it this way. If you want to have a disciple making culture within your organization, your ministry, or your church, it is absolutely 100% impossible unless everyday people are in the game. If you think about the revolutions across history, it was the everyday people, it was the foot soldiers that made those mm -hmm. things happen, any great change. And so for for everyday people to get involved, then we've, as leaders, one of our primary tasks is to look at Ephesians 4.12 and really do something about it, which is we are to equip God's people for the work of the ministry. And if we're going to equip people, then we have to have, drum roll, equipment. And so we've just found that, again, you know, many of the folks at discipleship.org, we have tools. And a small circle is just another one of those tools. Our focus happens to be on how to get, you know, everyday people to a table for two, but there are great tools that for microgroups, great tools for group ministry. And, and so I think the key, obviously, and it seems just so obvious that we have to have tools that we put in people's hands. And I think those tools have to be accessible. So, you know, we've talked about the mobile app. We have a mobile app that's, you know, simple to use. We have printed materials, PDFs and all that jazz. But it, the, the core of it is equipping people in a, in a very intentional way to get in, involved in that. And for me as a pastor, to be honest with you, you know, it's the Exodus 18 intersection where Jethro comes to Moses and says, hey, you got to, you got to spread the peanut butter a little uh, more evenly here. You're doing everything yourself. It's not good. And he's really speaking against an expert culture. 
And uh, I read a book once, I can't even remember the name of it, and some guy that took the time to mathematically figure it out, you know, when Moses divided into hundreds and fifties and tens and all that, the leadership structure. And it was like over a couple hundred thousand, as I remember, of available people right there in the mix that were not doing anything as Moses, you know, and a small team, you know, tackled it all. And so as a leader, I will say to you that it is absolutely thrilling and, and maybe my greatest thrill to see everyday people get into the mix and then they disciple someone who disciples someone else, who disciples someone else, who disciples someone else. So at our church, for example, we've been running one-to-one -one discipleship now for, gosh, about 15 years or so. And we are now in our sixth generation of Timothy discipling Bob, who discipled Mark, who discipled John, who discipled, you know, and on down the line. And every Sunday morning, we celebrate. Mm -hmm. Here are some new pairs that are starting their journey. Hey, let's give it up for them, encourage them. Hey, here are the pair that just finished. We just introduced a pair that is my fourth generation. So I discipled Dave, who discipled Emerson, who's now discipling Evan. And then we pull all four of us on, you know, up front and the man, we're like this. So we are, you know, celebrating what we want to replicate. So it's, it's super exciting. And it's super cool that we're not saying, here's the staff of the church and look at how great we're, we are and what we're doing. Yeah. So. So it's so a culture. Cool. Yeah. That's so cool. I love that. You know, one of the things that happened with COVID was everybody went home for a couple months and did church at home. And now you had all these pastors and preachers learning to upload their sermon to YouTube. They'd never done this before. They didn't know how to vid, like all this learning curve. But when the people went home, they began watching all kinds of different churches on YouTube and they began watching these amazing professionals who are so polished 10 times better than their local guy, you know, and it's like, how do you even compete? I hate to say it that way. You know what I mean? It's like, mm. and, and that professionalization, it was just like the bar just went way up here. I mean, I've, I had friends that were watching three or four worship services and these amazing preachers. And it just like, wow, that's really hard to, to compete with. But I think that raised the bar just a bit, but uh, in an unfortunate kind of way in some people's minds, not in a real kind of way, but in some people's minds, but you know, there's that real pressure on the preacher to preach to people who've been Christians and read their Bible for 60 years. And you're trying to preach John three in a way they'd never heard it before, you know, and now I've got to come up with this, but it, it does exactly what you're saying is it creates that expert culture where people think if I'm going to communicate anything in the Bible, it's got to be like this. And, and, um, that's really an unfortunate thing. You know, that first Peter two priesthood of all believers thing is real. And I, I agree a hundred percent with what you're saying. And it's a natural result of our, our systems and processes that we have that professionalization. I get it. I have an MDiv, you know, maybe get a DMIN at some point, you know, it's, but at the same time, man, it's like Wolfgang Simpson said one time, he said, revivals don't have, don't, revivals never start in a church building. Mm. He said, Cause he traveled the world finding revivals and seeing mm. what was going on. And he said, revival start in fields, revival start in barns, revival start in jails. He said, go down the list. It was like, we all want revival, but guess what? It doesn't start with a preacher. I was going to say, and, it, and that is always birth in everyday people unexpectedly. And yes, yeah. You can't programize a revival. Yeah. It's really interesting when we think of a typical church service, and this is the way it's done, but we, you know, we stand up, we're trained and we stand up in front and many people will say, wow, I can never do that. Well, the same thing is true at the disciple making level. You know, like I said, in the last session, every church has a handful of Yodas. They can go. And so, you know, occasionally we'll meet people that say, hey, we don't need tools. Hey, that's fine. If that, you know, I always say, hey, if you don't use tools, that's great. I would do just a kind of an inventory check then are you, are the people that you're investing, are you also teaching them how to invest in others and have that multiplication effect? Because that is the Jesus style, not just to be a, a master teacher, but he was teaching them to teach. And he sent out the 72, you know, in pairs, by the way. And I said, Hey, I want you guys to get your hands in, involved in this. But quite often those Yodas who are precious to us in our church culture that we love We'll go to a coffee shop 
bring their Bible and man, they can just navigate what they very unintentionally are doing with the person who's the recipient of that is that person is sitting there thinking, I can never do that. And to be honest with you, I think it's true. Yeah. Most people don't have those navigational skills. So that's the value of using tools. You know, another thing just to kind of bring in a close related lane to this road we're on. One of the things that I have noticed and particularly with one-to-one -one discipleship, and, and again, just like we said in our last session, I always like to emphasize this because I don't like the either or mindset or instead of like, Hey, you, you have to do this format and this is better than another format. I really do believe that like Jesus's ministry, he had the group, he had the crowd, he had the 72, he had the three, he had the relationship with John. It's kind of all the above mindset. But uh, distinctive to one, one of the beauties when it's, we're talking about getting everyday people in the game, let's face it. We have a, we have people that are in our churches that are bashful. It doesn't, you know, sometimes we divide the room between introverts and extroverts. I'm an extrovert and I'm completely fine with leading. I think sometimes we've, you know, miscalculated that word with, mm. but, but without a doubt, we have people that are shy, that are bashful that you could, you know, pay them a million dollars and they're not going to lead a group. It's just too much for them. And, or if they did lead a group, it, to be honest, it may not be effective, you know, yeah. that wouldn't be their deal. But one of the most exciting things for me over the years is to see a person that is, that has that shyness or they're, you know, they're used to playing, you know, second violin, they can make incredible disciple makers at a table for two. Mm. We, my wife and I have this couple in mind that from a different city that we knew they would be voted least likely to lead anything. And, uh, and man, they became disciple makers. And I think because they had been held in the bleachers for so long and not given an opportunity to be on the field, they just went all out as disciple makers. And for me, to have that everyday person just shine and you can see it in them. Like, man, I get to be on the field and doing something meaningful rather than let's just give them a menial task in the church because, you know, they're not going to lead. And so I, I just love that aspect that at a table for two, anyone, any personality is invited and can really shine. And for me, that's, you know, that's a big light bulb turn on. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I think part of what you're saying goes back to first Corinthians where Paul says, you know, I water, I, Paul, Apollos and I water, or we sowed and water, but God made it grow. And so now we have, we, we, uh, you know, we and God have different roles in this thing. You know, our call is to be faithful. Our call is to be obedient, just do what he said, follow Jesus, make disciples, like just so and water. And, but I think people get caught up on like, it's almost like I have to do God's job for him. Mm -hmm. And now I feel overwhelmed. I don't think I can do it. I feel insufficient. Can you just throw seed? Like, can you just take a Bible verse and just like tell someone that it says this? Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's not really complicated. Like the, yeah, the, that's the right. nuts and bolts are not. And the app that you have, Small Circle app, you know, I definitely want to point people to the app store on your phone and get the small circle app. I have it on my phone. It's really a great app and your website has tremendously good resources on it, but the best stuff is just so simple. It's like when the new Testament was written in Koine Greek, they, um, until Adolf Diesman in like 1900, they thought this was Holy spirit Greek because it didn't sound like classical Greek. It didn't sound like Homer. They were like, this is different Greek. Why is it different Greek? Oh, it's because the Holy spirit inspired it. And then they realized that when they got in the rubbish heaps of, of Egypt and they started finding receipts and marketplace stuff of the everyday guys. It was like, this is the same kind of Greek as in the <laughs> Bible. It's coining. It's the common, simple, mm -hmm. not all simple, yeah. but it's the common everyday marketplace. Yeah. Greek. yeah. You know what? Yeah. God wrote the Bible in everyday person language. Yes. I think, you know, one of the interesting things for us, one of our cornerstone Bible verses in John 17, 2021, 20, you know, there's, there's three parts to that prayer. The first part, of course, Jesus is transitioning. I've, Father, I've given you glory on earth by accomplishing you, 
you know, what you've given me to do. Second part, he prays for the, the 11 disciples remaining that, you know, God will protect them. He knows what they're going to face. And then, of course, the tide changes at, at, at verse 20, where Jesus says, I'm praying for those basically in the future. I'm praying for those who will believe in their message that will ripple through generations of time in the future. Mm. And when he prays, I find it interesting that he could have prayed, Father, I pray you'll make them Bible scholars, although there's nothing wrong with Bible scholars. I pray that you'll make them great teachers, although there's nothing wrong with great teachers. I pray that there'll be prayer warriors. I'll pray that there'll be great evangelists, you know, all, all those things he could have prayed. But he said, I pray that they will be one. And so often we look at that as being in unity with one another across the body of Christ. And certainly, there, there is some truth to that, but he does put a, a clarifier and he said, Father, I pray that they will be one just as you are in me and I'm in you. And he goes back to that relationship between two people, that is Jesus and the Father. And he's saying, I pray that they'll experience this intimacy and that we're created for that. He's not praying for pastors there only. He's not praying for teachers only. He's praying for every single Christ follower to experience that relational depth. The tools are only a means to an end. They're not a means. This is discipleship is not about more information. Just like you said during COVID, man, we got as much information from the best preachers and teachers around the world. But it really is and taking that truth and amplifying that truth through relational depth. And when we get to that level, then truth, like in Ephesians 4, 15, it can be delivered in a different way. It's going to be delivered through a bridge of trust and, and love. Hmm. This is the key, I think, for everyday people so that we can tell them, look, you don't have to be an expert. That's, this is not our end goal. Our end goal is, of course, we're growing in knowledge. We, we know that, that Bible verse, that, but we're, we're growing in knowledge of Christ. We're all actually even growing in knowledge of each other. Uh, and so it's a, it's a different value than just learning more information. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, it's an open door for everyday people yeah. so that, that we can reach that relational that relational edge. It's funny, I, you know, Larry Crabb is with the Lord now. We had some interchange one time. He wrote this wonderful book called Safest Place on Earth. I think he's republished it under a different name. I think Building True Spiritual Community or something like that. But it really is a such a deep writing about getting to this relational cavern with each mm. other. And I was so fascinated by this and I was and the question that kept haunting me is like, can you get to this relational depth by, by sitting in a, let's say a group of 12 people are sitting in a class and I, I'm like, man, how do you do that? I've been in groups all my life and I love groups. I love the community of a group, but to get to that, you know, that really that David Jonathan level for everyday people, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. And so I wrote him an email. He never heard of me. I, I'm a pretty no name person. And I thought, you know, the likelihood of hearing back was pretty close to zero. And I said, Hey, I've really enjoyed the book. Are you getting to this level in the groups in your church? And he said, you know, Steve, to be honest with you and all the groups he did. So he wrote back, which was shocking, but he said, all the groups in my church, I only know one group that is getting to that level. And that's my group. And we're getting to that level for two reasons. Number one, I, I'm an expert. I know how to navigate people to that deeper level. And number two, nobody has left our group and nobody has joined our group in many years. And, and I think it takes that length. He goes, but I really, I really think and believe that the only way that we can get there is get some, we got to get smaller somehow. And that's not, again, it's not instead of, but it's just an addition to. So if we're in our groups, everyday people in groups, how do we navigate that down to, you know, two or three people together or in our case, one-to-one. -one. And then he makes this statement that I think sums up so much of, I think, the core of discipleship. He said, I've become convinced that a certain level of life change 
is directly connected to a certain level of relational depth. Mm. And I think all of us would say that, like when we look back at our own personal history, you're like, hey, there was that, there was that guy that really poured into me, or there was that gal that really poured into me. And uh, everyday people pouring into everyday people and to have a culture like that is just super exciting. So like in our own church, we have probably about 160 people in one-to-one disciple making. And I'll sometimes walk into a coffee shop and see two people and they, you know, they've got the tools and they're working at it. And I'm like, man, that is so much more exciting than me doing it. Our tools are now in um, probably 140 plus countries. And just to see people doing it in villages and major cities and different languages and closed nations who were in many persecuted languages. I got an email yesterday from a, one of our leaders in Bolivia. He said, we're now in the Bolivian prison system with small circle, one-to-one everyday prisoners doing disciple making within their system. Just a few weeks ago, I was standing inside a federal prison, the only federal prison in North Carolina and with probably 150 inmates who had been navigating towards using small circle and the guy that was leading it, who had been in the penitentiary as an inmate three times, he, uh, he said, okay, I just want to see how, if you guys, are you ready to start? How many Paul Timothy relationships do we have already set up so that we can get going? And I got to tell you, man, across the room, there were hands, everyday guys inmates in a federal prison, probably 80 hands went up. We're ready to start disciple making at a table for two. And the guy that was leading it, man, he is like the epitome of an everyday people. His, his, uh, ministry and his discipleship in this prison has just gotten the attention of the attorney general of North Carolina. They have a recidivism of only 2% when they graduate from his program. But he said something that reminded me of, you know, what we're doing at discipleship.org. He said, so I was in prison three times and the second time I came to Christ and you might ask, so why did I come back the third time? And he said, because no one walked with me after I came to Christ. Mm. And it just reminded me of the value of everyday people, not only discipling, but being discipled. Wow. Critical. We could go through the entire Bible and pretty much any name in there. I mean, except for the government people and, you know, Pilate and Caesar and people like that. I mean, they were all ordinary people, fishermen and murderers and all kinds of people. You know, I mean, it was like, this is how God operates. And somehow we have the, the, the pastor system that we think that's how God operates. That's yeah. very few people, highly specialized, super experienced, you know, again, very few of them. It's like, no, that's, that doesn't. That's good. Those are good things and good people and sacrificial people sometimes working two jobs to do it. And just, I mean, there's so, so much praise to be given to people who pastor a church hundred percent, but to think that's where movements are going to come from, or that's where the most fruit's going to come from is like, man, it can't rely on coming and, and giving on the plate and then hoping that pays the guy to come get the job done for us. It's like, that's not a sustainable or effective strategy. Yeah. We can yeah. the Bible and, and talk about those people. We could go through the other, we see it all over the world right now in Africa and Asia, Middle East, where it's just exploding through everyday people. Yeah, it's so true. And I, I'll, let me just speak to pastors for a second, because even for me, when I came to Christ, I was studying to be a concert pianist and I was studying in a high level conservatory in Boston. And I came to Christ, the pastor was from India. He took me under his wing. And I spent a year and a half every Thursday night having dinner in his apartment flat and then, um, and then having a table for two time. And, uh, so I, I joke, I don't know if, for those outside our country, they may not know AA, but I, my joke is I thought, Hey, I thought you guys as Christians were like AA, you know, you, you sign up, you get a sponsor. <laughs> and so I, I did, it was shocking to me that, you know, we weren't more intentional about it. Mm-hmm. And so when I. When I think about our church culture and I think about pastors, even for me, 
uh, when we planted our church, I was so excited about disciple making. And yet there was this haunting what if going on in my mind. And I think as pastors, we wrestled this, with this, that just like when Jesus released the 72 and they were in one-to-one pairs, but when he released the 72, well, what if they blow it? What if they say something crazy? You know, for me, I was thinking, okay, what if we put disciple making in the hands of everyday people and Bob on the first session is going to, you know, lay into the beast of, in the book of Revelation or, you know, Mary is going to go off the chart with some deep doctrinal, you know, so there as pastors, there sometimes is a, a release, not in a negative way, like we're control freaks, but in a way that we don't want the ship to drift down the river in a trajectory that, and so there's a little bit of a reticence sometimes to put disciple making into the hands of everyday people. But look, we can't be stopped by the what ifs. And I will tell you with great confidence that in 15 years of allowing everyday people to disciple, the contrast between the value and the benefits versus the very little times where you have to address something and, and course correct is enormous. It's people. Yes, there are going to be things that you're going to have to jump in like, hey, you know, we might, we might do that a different way. But that's true for groups. Yeah. That's true for your worship team. That's, that's already true. true. Yes, that's, yeah. true. that's already true. Hard. So my message for pastors is, is if you're struggling like I did with like, oh man, what happens if we put disciple making in the hands of everyday people? Let God do God's thing. This was the commission that is that no one has an exemption. Go into all the world. And if he were Southern, he'd say, go into all the world, y'all. And he meant everybody. <laughs> let it, let that thing go and just watch what God will do. Mm -hmm. So last question here is, you know, after 14, 15 years of this, what kind of things are in place that, or effect that you see impact that wouldn't maybe be there if you had gone a, a different route? I mean, do you have more leaders developed within your church that like a leader, good leadership pipeline or like, what are some of the residuals or just results that are present after 15 years of creating that kind of culture? Yeah, that's a great question because if, if we didn't see any difference, then, you know, yeah. what are we doing here? And I think we all, as pastors, we've all signed up for the ministry to navigate people, to grow into the image of Christ and to see life change and to see maturity and see multiplication and all those things. Number one, we've seen greater levels of multiplication. That means more leadership, more disciple makers, more generations of disciple making. So we've seen, and again, I attribute that to having some kind of intentional tool to overcome the inadequacy that most people find. I think that's critical. Number two, we've seen relational depth that I have not witnessed prior to this. I served in a, a, a mega church, I would say for, for a number of years and uh, great, great preaching. And it wasn't me, so not <laughs> too much, but a really great preacher, uh, and, uh, just amazing, amazing people. But we were very programmatic. We had a lot of, you know, activity going on, but when we've gotten down into this level of disciple making, we've seen greater relational depth. And number three, because of the relational depth we've seen greater maturity and greater life change in a way that I would use the word, and I don't use it lightly, unprecedented. And uh, for me, that's, that's really exciting. And so uh, when you begin to see multiple generations, I guess I would add a fourth thing. I see a church family that's excited about the right things. Mm. We're not excited about the building. We worship in an old warehouse. We're not excited about how many programs we got. Not even excited about, you know, we, we have a lot of people coming to our church, but the thing that it, I feel like it has nurtured a culture within our church family where they're excited about the things that God's excited about. And then when we've seen this ripple across the world and seeing how it's multiplying and hearing back results that I've just talked about, man, it is super cool 
to see a church family get excited about that mm. rather than the next activity or program. Love it. I love it. Well, thank you, Steve, for your yeah, heart man. Yeah. and what you're doing. And please give, give that website too for the resources. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. It's smallcircle.com. And when you go to the website, as I said in the last session, in case you didn't catch it, we open-handedly re-gift our tools. So there's, you'll find downloadable PDFs. There are many languages. We're in over 60 languages now. Uh, we have a mobile app. We have a free library. If you want to get like nuts and bolts, A to Z, you can go to on the website and you'll see free courses and that will give you the full gamut of what small circle is, why it is, what we're doing and everything. Or you can go straight to, you know, to one of the, to Apple uh, store or Google play, and you can uh, download the mobile app, small circle, one word. That's awesome. And as I said previous, I've got it on my phone. It's a wonderful app. And don't forget also the forums coming up in May. We'll invite everybody who's watching or listening to that, to come to the annual forum. And that we'll put links to that in the description. So uh, thank you so much, Steve. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, man. Thank you too, Matt. Appreciate you guys and appreciate discipleship.org so much.